we're going to have a good time. Let's just have a discussion. And hopefully Kevin just walks in, and then I can kind of get out of the, the spotlight. Um, Uva doesn't know this, maybe, but I always like to say that my sort of most important education came growing up in Brooklyn, New York, and public housing. Uh, I always like to say that just because I think it gives some context uh, of you know, where people come from, I think, really um, creates specific reflections on what they think about land use and urban planning and the like. And uh, so knowing someone's background fully beyond just uh, what schools they went to, I think, is important. So this was supposed to just be kind of a, a backdrop to the conversation um, with Kevin Orr. Um, question, though, how many people here have actually been to Detroit? Now, I have my hand up because I just got off the plane from Detroit. So, you know, I, and I was touring uh, some neighborhoods. And how many people here have a sense of why Detroit went bankrupt? OK, cool, cool. Well, we can hopefully debate that with Kevin. Um, so what I wanted to talk about uh, is planning in the time of bankruptcy and just give you a couple of big picture points that really um, sometimes don't get fleshed out in kind of the current conversation about Detroit. Um, and, you know, I should point out that picture. Well, two things here. One is, does anyone recognize this picture? This is the sort of iconic Joe Louis fist in Detroit, Joe Louis being a boxer uh, um, from Detroit, and they have uh, made it a point. And I always like to use this picture just because it shows that Detroit is fighting right now. And uh, just like Joe Lewis was a champion, hopefully uh, Detroit will be a champion again. And finally, if you guys are talking about me behind my back on Twitter, might as well just put my Twitter handle on there so I can find you one day. So, um, so let's, uh, let's talk. And we, we, what we didn't want to do is really like have a, a long legalese discussion about bankruptcy. But really, how does bankruptcy affect urban planning and land use issues, but also kind of what is the context of Detroit? And kind of let's uh, have a quick little conversation about that. So three things, um, and this is the first one, um, population loss, scale, and then one more that I'll, I'll leave for, for, the, for the end. Um, so population loss. And everyone's kind of heard that Detroit was losing population, right? But the details of that are, are kind of important. So if you go way back. Uh, well, let's just go back way to 1950, where you saw Detroit at 1.85 million people. And actually, even though the population started to decline a little bit, in 1960, Detroit had the highest per capita income in the country. So Detroit was on fire. Uh, Motor City, and it was a city that had two brands, right? It was both Motor City, it was known for music, so it had a whole industry revolving around that, as well as being known for the auto industry. And if you think about it, Kevin Orr is here. If you think about it, having a city whose brand revolves around two industries which ultimately died, or ultimately had significant structural problems that that changed the face of the industry and its, its viability, they would have had to have predicted that back in the 50s and 60s and started to structurally change itself. And one city that's done something like that, it's Pittsburgh, that had a certain set of industries. And through uh, the efforts of many, um, including uh, my good friend Tom Murphy, the former mayor, really changed the industry cl clusters that kind of ran the city. Uh, so, you see that uh, the population significantly declined. But you know, it's, it's always good to like, kind of have some context. So if you take the city of Chicago in 1950, it had 3.6 million people. And by 2010, it lost about 925,000 people. And it's funny, because most, most people don't talk about Chicago and Detroit in the same sentence. But Chicago has almost the same issues that Detroit has. And um, some of the, the same things that you know, Kevin Orr will talk about in terms of getting Detroit to have to go into bankruptcy are true in Chicago right now. Um, and so I like to use the Chicago comparison. Um, but if you look at Detroit, which was half the size of Chicago in 1950, it actually lost more people, both by percentage, but also in sheer numbers by 2010. So that gives you a real sense of like, what these numbers mean. And then I always like to get visual, too. So you know, if you were having a conversation about the population of Detroit uh, in 1950, and then you said, oh, well, what really happened? 
Yeah, you know, it kind of went from that to, you know, Chicago probably went to something like this. I mean, it was a decline, it was significant, but there are neighborhoods in Detroit where the decline really looks like that. I mean, it's really that stark. Um, do you want to just come on in and so, well, let's give a round of applause to Kevin Orr. I'm sorry. I'm choreographed as part of the dramatic well, entry. Well, actually, I had the experience of a burgeoning urban environment trying to find parking. <laughs> so uh, we can only hope for so much uh, uh, in Detroit. Calvin, good to see you again. Good to see you again. How have you been? Good. Um, Same old story. Sure. Okay, well, sure. I was given a little backdrop, uh, showed a couple of pictures. Uh, okay. And actually, I'll just go really quickly back to just show you Population loss. Population yeah. loss. Yeah. I was kind of giving them three big picture things that were important to sort of really understand. Okay. Um, both the sort of sheer numbers of it, yeah. uh, a real comparison to like a Chicago yeah. to give a sense of you know what it really meant in terms of Detroit, mm -hmm. and then my quick visual to say if Detroit's population looked like this in 1950, you know the other cities that had declining populations, you might have heard of St. Louis, right. like the. The, the decline, the contraction kind of looks like this, but in neighborhoods of Detroit, um, the population contraction kind of looks like that. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, if you fair. go to the east side, which uh, I was. East side, west side, Brightmoor, yep. um, except for East Jefferson Quarter and the CBD, Central Business District, we've lost, uh, well, we lost um, a quarter of a million people. We went from 220,000 to roughly 700,000 between 2010, 2000 and 2010. That was the mass exodus, and that was really the exodus of the black middle class. The decline that Calvin was showing you from 1950 forward was the well-discussed and reported exodus of the white middle class. Detroit, um, if you look at uh, Thomas Segrew's book, um, how many have read Thomas Segrew's book, The Origin of the Urban Crisis, Race and Inequality um, in Detroit? Anybody, you've read it. It's worth the read. It's, it's, it is a great um, composite, not just of Detroit, but basically white flight, um, but an intentional white flight. Redlining was an intentional policy of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board and the National Board of Realtors. Um, they instituted that policy so you could not get conforming mortgages in certain areas. If there was one black family in that area, they would draw a red line around the area, and they, you were prohibited by federal law state law and policy by the Board of Realtors from showing that home in that area to white residents or providing a loan. So that policy of redlining was officially pioneered in Detroit as a means of segregation. That was the flight you saw from the 50s. The flight you saw from 2000 to 2010 was the black middle class during the kleptocracy of Mayor uh, Kwame uh, Kilpatrick. Um, I, don't, I haven't spent a whole lot of time trying to apportion blame um, in this whole process, but if there's blame to be a portion, it, it, some of it certainly falls there. Um, we estimate that his uh, kleptocracy accounts for somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 million dollars missing. Can you tell us what you mean by kleptocracy? Um, a system of government that is designed to loot the body politic. Um, usually seen in West African uh, body pals, but occasionally seen in the United States. Edmund Edwards, Louisianians like a little crime with their politics. Vote for the crook is important. Um, and in this case, uh, Mayor Kilpatrick, who, and this is the 119 count indictment that chronicalized the structure, the, the specific, his, his father's company was called Maestro because you had to go to the Maestro to get a government contract and he would hit you up. It got so bad that Walbridge, one of the largest construction companies, just got to a point, they would just pay his frat brother not to work. Here, we'll just give you a million dollars on this project. Don't show up. Don't, we don't want you to do any work, but that's the cost of doing business was a tax. And uh, we estimate that that cost the city somewhere near home is a quarter billion dollars. Wow. Well, yeah. let me go to my second kind of big picture yeah. point, and we'll have you react to this one. Sure. Uh, land mass. Yes. And Huge. this is one that <laughs> somewhat gets talked about in Detroit, but I, I love to mm. kind of give a real backdrop to the, the sort of land mass issues that apply to Detroit, which are somewhat unique in the country. So, I mean, Detroit's a big city. I mean, people kind of talk about Detroit like it's this little small town, but Detroit's the real deal in terms of its yeah. infrastructure and bones. Um, so if you look at it, I mean, it's a sprawling city. It's 139 square miles, which makes it one of the geographically widest, broadest, um, largest cities in the country. 
Um, and you know, there's only a certain amount of places. So if you, if you layer this point, 139 square miles, with a city that was 1.85 million people strong, and now has about 700,000 people, you know, that creates some, some pretty inherent problems. And just to give you another sense of scale, um, the Boston, San, Francisco. San Francisco, Boston, and Manhattan, in terms of their geographic area, could all fit inside the geographic area of the city of Detroit, the city of Detroit. And so if you say, and actually I looked at some, some newer numbers just a minute ago, the populations of Boston, Manhattan, and San Francisco now are about 3 million combined. And the population of Detroit is about 700,000. So if you think about what that means in terms of what ends up being left when you have that much population loss in a city of this size, um, it, it really creates some you know, very interesting um, things to, to resolve. And you know, let this me, goes- Let me just comment on that before yeah. you get to stage, Calvin. When you look at that number, just, just think of this. Um, that's four times the density of Detroit, those three cities if you put them in. All of you know, why does that matter? If you have a 52 inch, um, water main, sewer main that you have to maintain. You have to run water and you have to run sewer through it, otherwise it decays and, and it breaks down. So even in the less dis dis uh, populated areas, you've got to maintain that. If you have a police force of 2715, 2715, New York has a police force of 33,000, okay? You've got to make a patrol schedule for scout cars to cover areas where maybe there's one or two homes. I mean, it's delivery of services over huge landmass without density, so you don't get economies of scale. You get a lot of inefficiency. And you know, despite the vacancy that's described, there are people living in all of these neighborhoods. Yeah. Now, there are parts of the city where there are literally acres and acres of city blocks of vacant land, but right next to them are one house on a block, two houses on a block. So you really have issues where even in that top sort of left corner, there's some people that live up there. And so the infrastructure, city services, and all of those things still right now service those people. Not particularly well, but they do. And so how do you deal with those issues? Because these are real people with real lives who made it through all of the issues. And ethically and morally, when you think about, you know, what is the government supposed to do? It's supposed to provide services to its citizens. That's the covenant that you pay taxes, we provide you services, sewer, water, fire, police. Two thirds of Detroit's budget is public safety. There, there are roughly 9,000 in current employees, but 6,000 are on the general fund budget. Of that 6,000, roughly 4,000 of them in public safety, 2,700 police, 1,100 firemen, 400 EMTs. And if you count the 396 FTEs, over at the uh, 36th District Court, that's the majority of the general fund budget is public safety. So if you're not providing that public safety, if you're not providing that envelope, if you're not treating 615 gallons of water and seven million and 715 million gallons of sewage each day, um, which is what the Enterprise Fund at the Detroit Water and Sewer Department does, if you're not doing that, then you're not meeting that covenant. And consequently, the way that blew back on us is you see somewhere between 50 to 65% tax compliance. People just voting with their purses, literally not paying. And I'm not talking about this year. I'm talking about for decades. People not paying their water bill, 50 to 60% compliance with water bill payments. There were municipalities, the Detroit Water Sewer Department has 184 customers. Hamtramck and Highland Park, which are in the center of the city, if, if, if this was colored, there'd be a little block in there that would be blocked out, Hamtramck and Highland Park, they never sent out water bills. So last summer when we started sending out water bills, people were getting them saying, what's this? You would get the Detroit Water Brigade reports of, of the UNHCR, High Commissioner for Human Rights, ACLU, and WACP Legal Defense Fund coming in and say water is a human right. But there were two points to that. One, some of these people genuinely never realize you're supposed to pay for a utility. Otherwise you can't fund it, you can't pay the funded debt. The other thing is there was a huge water battle going on in Ireland at the time. And Detroit was used as an apocryphal tale to leverage off the battle that the Irish government was charging for water too, to make that sort of an allegory for the international water rights issue overseas. So you, you have all these other issues coming at play in the city at that time. And let me ask you about one other utility issue, public lighting. Huge, huge. Uh, public light, 40% of our lights were out and had been out for decades. They were incandescent or fluorescent, not LEDs. 
Uh, one of the things, and, and this is a, a real issue because a dark city portends crime. 60% of our fire department calls were either for blighted buildings or abandoned structure. That means we're running vehicles, we're putting our first responders at risk 60% of the time for unnecessary calls. Um, and sometimes either get equipment stolen or they get shot at. So it's, it's, it's pretty dangerous. That's changed somewhat in the past year, but at the time you were really putting them at risk. Uh, our EMTs were running that 60% of their calls were unnecessary. They were non-life threatening. And we had an 80% mortality rate for the first 45 minutes. If you had a heart attack in the city, there was an 80% chance they weren't going to get to you and you were going to die. Okay? So, th so that's the consequence. But the other consequence is crime. Um, for twofold. One, intentional crime, violent crime, where people break in when it's dark, it's opportunistic. Second one is petty crime, but who are the principal victims of the petty crime? The young. We don't have school buses. Our children ride our, our city buses, we have vouchers. So in November through March, in the dark, you'll have first, second graders standing in the dark, waiting for a bus, coming home in the dark after a bus, and susceptible to you know, being beat up by the neighborhood toughs, or worse. So lighting is a real issue. Um, that was one of the key things that we wanted to get to last year. We stood up a public lighting authority. We had to take the lighting function out of PLD, uh, public lighting department out of PLD, put it into an authority, and we had to fund them both for capital and for operating expense. But we are now on schedule to get all of our lights lit with new LEDs, some with shot spotters, new technology going forward. We've leapfrogged overpass technology. We should, uh, Coda and Otis, Otis Jones, the lighting director, <laughs> yep. um, we might make it by the end of this year ahead of schedule. So we're very happy about that because of the blowback, both operationally, but also in crime and uh, public safety. And we'll get back to this. What? Ah, that's what I was going to say. Lighting but, department. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 you want to? No, you go ahead. Uh, well, one of the things in the restructuring, Detroit had $18 billion in debt total. Um, $5.7 billion of that was uh, legacy costs, principally in OPEP, other employee benefits, health care, retiree health care, not current employee health care, for which there had been, not been a dime. $3.5 billion of that was unfunded pension obligations, uh, which were, had been deferred over a period of time, unfunded actuarial liability, UAAL. Only $2 billion of that was the general uh, bond debt, uh, funded debt. So by relieving what we did in the bankruptcy was we crammed down some of the legacy obligations we had on pensions and on health care. Um, we set up a VEBA so we could move the health care out from, because the city was paying retiree health care out of current dollars. So it wasn't savings, it was a current operating expense. And in the next five years, it was slated to go to about 67 to 72% of the general fund budget, just legacy costs in health care. So that meant somewhere between 670 million to $720 million by the year 2023 was going to be dedicated legacy costs, you could not fund the city. You can't cut enough FTEs. You can't manage it. So we had to relieve that pressure, and we retasked that money from health care into funding lighting. The good thing about lighting is once we restructured our health care obligations, we were able to go to the capital markets and send out lighting bonds. Those bonds sold out in less than 10 hours. They were oversubscribed because once you fixed a balance sheet, people realized we were pretty good credit risk and we were managing our affairs despite what the bond buyers and some of the others had to say uh, during the course of the bankruptcy about how we were going to ruin life in the free world as we knew it. Cats and dogs were going to start sleeping with each other. You know, the world was going to fall apart. Capitalism was going to be destroyed. The reality is uh, most of my friends who are in the capital markets are rational, and once they saw the city could meet its budget and pay its bills as it became due, we actually drove down our interest rate to an investment grade from a junk bond rate, and we oversubscribed the bond market to pay for the lighting. So we, once you get your house in order, it's a pretty quick turn, but uh, it, it, there was some teeth gnashing and name calling and all that good stuff, and eh, it's part of it. So <laughs> we talked about two things so far that create kind of unique problems in Detroit. The population loss, the, the, you know, just the size of it, and, right. and in a way, the speed of it, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, as well as just the land mass of Detroit. And those are intertwined. Right. But there's a third issue that I wanted to bring up that I'll have you react to as well, um, which is the scale of the problems. Yeah. So, you know, there are a lot of cities that have similar problems to Detroit. Detroit's not the only city with vacancy issues, yeah. unfunded pension liability issues. As a matter of fact, there's some cities coming down the pike. Three, three trillion nationwide. Right. So yeah. this is not, so in many ways, Detroit problems are not unique. 
But because of the scale that goes back to population loss in a city with this land mass, you end up with problems that have a different scale, even though it's the same problem. So as an example, I've been using Chicago as a kind of comparison because it's a big city. It's in the Midwest, and people sort of know Chicago. So in Chicago, there's 2.7 million people uh, in 2013. Um, and according to Crane, Chicago, they had 33,000 blighted homes. So that's significant blight. It's a huge problem. Um, Chicago is a little bigger in terms of land mass than Detroit, but not by a lot, actually. Um, and so that's significant. Detroit, let's go back for a second. 2.7 million people in Chicago. Detroit has about, give or take, 700,000 people. Yeah, 700,000. Yeah. And it has 73,000 blighted homes. So if you, you sort of put that on one slide and just sort of soak it in, like seasoning, if anybody gets that, um, the scale of the problem changes how you can solve it. Yeah. I mean, it's, if you did this visually, you'd say, well, if someone said, oh, I had this sort of blight problem, and mine looks like this, and I don't know what to do, you'd say, well, my problem looks like that. Right. And so that changes the solution set. Yeah, it, it, the, the blight at home issue, about um, 73,000 out of 383, or roughly 20% of our housing stock was blighted, and it, it wasn't evenly dispersed. So there's some neighborhoods in Detroit, East Indian Village, oh, yeah. uh, Boston Edison, oh, yeah. uh, that are very, quite nice. Um, in fact, uh, some folks will go in and try to get some of the woodwork, because you can't get that kind of woodwork anymore mm -hmm. done and, mm -hmm. and try to bring it out. So there's some, these were the whole old um, uh, auto executive mansions that you can get for $100,000. I mean, a million dollars will get you a house in, in uh, 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 Gross Point, we were, my wife and I were looking at it, you know, it has a ballroom, you know, it's 10,000 square feet, it has a view of the water. A million dollars in Washington, D.C. gets you a 3-1 fixer-upper. Right. You know, right. So, so it's a different scale. So when you, you're dealing with 20% of your housing stock that's blighted, there are three things to take away from there. Uh, one, um, it's an attractive for squatters and for crime. Okay, because nobody's watching. One of the things about a, a village, a neighborhood, is we're together in this, and so there, there's a community ethos, right? Uh, your grass is a little long, John. You know, in the upper Kumiofo, upper income, white collar neighborhoods, gee, you're painting your house uh, chartreuse. That's interesting. <laughs> and, uh, um, right. In fact, in some neighborhoods, there are neighborhood association limits, right? You have to use toenail clippers to get the edges by the lawns, and you can't paint your curbs, and you know, no, no vans out in front of the house, no working class behavior, all that kind of stuff, right? But, but when you're down at this level, that, that is a distant memory. We're talking about living across for 30 years from a house as a 20-year-old oak tree growing up through the roof. Secondly, the, the second problem with that is that becomes normal. Um, Moynihan got castigated for his report, but one of the things he mentioned back in the 70s was defining deviancy down, accepting a level of dysfunction as normal in ways that no other community would accept. When you get to a level that generations, you have people walking by that and think it's normal. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk, you can go down East Jefferson, and there's a road called Alter, and that's the border of Detroit and the Gross oh. Point. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's 30 feet wide. I did wide. this yesterday. You did it? Okay. You did. 30 Literally. feet wide. 30 feet wide. Literally the, the length of this room. This side of East Jefferson, detritus, garbage, needles, um, people hang out in a corner. That side, nirvana. Beautiful gross point. Yoga studio. Yoga as soon as you stu cross yoga, the border. As soon as you to yoga, studio. yoga studio and and uh, and uh, frozen yogurt, you know, yep. what I mean, and you know, and juice bars. I mean, whatever, whatever is trendy will come in, right? Right, thirty feet away. And here, here's the most interesting phenomenon: the people on the west side of Alter will not cross that Pretoria line. It might as well be a wall. Yep. They will self-arrest and don't dare go on just for a walk. Up Lakeshore Drive. Now, I'll tell you, I learned okay. some things yesterday. <laughs> okay. Because some of the parks in Gross Point, you actually have to have ID to get in. Oh, you have to have a Gross Point ID to get All the water parks, as right. you go up and around Lakeshore, you, know, you, you, know, you not only have to have an ID, you have to have a Gross Point ID. Now, there used to be something in Detroit called the Red Cheek Test. This was for white Jewish discrimination. They could slap or pinch your cheek, and if it didn't turn red, you couldn't be a member of those clubs. Okay, our issue 
we wear in our sleeves, right? It's a little more common. So what they did was they didn't do it racially. You know, if it's economic. If you can afford to live in Gross Point, you can go to these parks. The two yep. or three of you um, can come. You're not a threat. But if you don't have an ID, you can't go to the water park. And they're great parks. I, I ain't hating. You know, they're great parks. But that self-arresting behavior is an internalization of the dysfunction. It's a cultural oppression. The third thing about it is, how do you feel about your community? If your tax rate is the maximum tax rate in the state of Michigan, you're not getting services. Around you looks like a war zone, as, as Bob Simon called it. I don't say that in public because I'm a big Detroit supporter, and I think the people have been very resilient in dealing with this. But if you're working hard, you come home, and this is what you're dealing with, then your, your ethos, your commitment as a citizen starts to get depressed. You get hurt. You know, the story of Ferguson, yes, it was the police. The real story of Ferguson was an integrated system of oppression where the judge was telling the police, in order to fund the city, yep. you must oppress these people, and I will issue orders approving it where good cops were coming in and saying to their supervisors, I don't want to do that, and they were being told, you got to get with the program, okay? The oppression that you saw wasn't just Michael Brown, it was years. New Jim, new, Neo Jim Crow, Neo Jim Crow, okay? So when you have people coming through these things, covenant's broken, the, the dysfunction becomes normal, and the ethos is that my community, no one cares, is failing me, it breeds a level of dissension. What does that do to a seven, eight, nine-year-old thinking about themselves and what's the kind of citizen they want to be in America? When they may turn on the TV and see the Cosbys, or, I don't want to use that example, <laughs> may turn on TV yeah. and, and see someone who's very nice, uh, Brady Bunch, we'll go back right. real far right. back, okay? Right. See somebody like that, and that's not their neighborhood, okay? What does that do to the ethos? So it's, it's tangible and intangible right. is, is the point I'm trying to get to. So one more slide that I want you to react to okay. uh, and see if you recognize this number. This goes back to this point of scale. So you take population loss, you take just these issues of land mass, and you take kind of all the scale issues that go with that, and then you see something that says this. Mm -hmm. And so this is the number. I was on the Blight Removal Task right, Force. Right, right, right. Uh, for all of it. For, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so this was the number that was thrown out just to fix that 73,000 blighted, blighted home number, plus the 6,106 vacant lots. Yeah. Actually, this number does not include the, the commercial? commercial properties mm -hmm. above 25,000 square feet, because Detroit's history as a history of the arsenal of, of democracy, democracy. Yeah. means that you have a lot of sites that have what kind of problems? Anybody? You have a lot of industrial sites that have been abandoned for 20 years. Environmental, environmental problems. So the estimate is there's another 500 mm. to a billion dollars in potential costs on top of this number just to deal with the industrial properties, which is tough, right? Because that's the soul of what made Detroit Detroit. Union Carbide factory down in East Jefferson. Oh. Okay. Still under remediation. They still have the towers where they're venting, right? How long? Another 20 years. So, you know, these scale issues translate into real dollars. And I like this as a segue because we're kind of here to talk about bankruptcy. <laughs> um, and, you know, when you look at a number like this, it makes you think you got to do something different than the status quo in order to get out of this box. So now I'm going to come take a seat here. I'm just kind of making all this up. But actually, let's leave uh, my favorite, since we're going to talk about fighting. Let's just leave the Joe Lewis fist up Joe there. Lewis, brown bomber. So, um, so, you know, I was, I sort of channeled my inner Larry King, and I did some homework, and I said, I need to make sure I'm going to do some hard-hitting questions, make, put this man on the spot. Right. And so I'm going to start with a tough one, which okay. is, so, you know, you were working in Detroit for a while, right. um, and obviously you've been here. Right. So, and I don't know if anybody follows baseball. Anybody follow baseball here? Well, yeah. apparently, the two top teams who, are, according to the experts, are likely to go to the World Series right. are the Detroit Tigers in the American League and the Washington Nationals, Nationals in the National League. Right. So, as my first hard-hitting question, if those two teams were in the World Series, who would you root for? 
well, I was going to root for the Red Sox, so I'll just stay out of it. Oh. My team won't be in the series. Oh, okay, so. well, there you go. We got some Boston. <laughs> who would, who, who who would I root for? I, I have been a Tigers fan since Sparky Anderson oh. uh, was the manager. And since the Nationals are a new team and will have more longevity, I would love to see the Tigers win because that'd be a great huh. sort of metaphor for the city. Huh. You got to leave. I got it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, another, I had another personal question for you. We should sure. just start personal. Yeah, um, yeah, my life's an open book. I don't care. Yeah. So the first time we met, and I don't know if you recall, but uh, was at on a 6 a.m. flight to Detroit. Yeah, I remember it. Yep. I remember it. Oh, it good. was on the shuttle, Delta shuttle. Yes. Yeah, flight 2714. Because it's the um, same flight number. It's the same flight every day. All the I mean, time. All the time. Right. And so and there's only a couple of people on the plane. <laughs> and so I remember getting off the plane, and it was this sort of medium-sized guy, and he was kind of yeah, yeah. checking me out. And yeah, I was like, yeah. well, I, I, you know. We, yeah. And, you know, he stood there, and he walked off, and I said, oh, that's Kevin's security. Yeah. So what was it like in the context of being in Detroit and being who you were and doing this job? but also having these personal... Um, th that was interesting. The, the governor, Rick Snyder, who I have a great admiration and fondness for, I think he, you know, it was a Washington Post article a few weeks back about we don't have any elected e leaders except for Mike, and I thought that was, respectfully, I, I like the Post, but I thought that was wrong. Um, people don't recognize Rick Snyder put this into play in the first term of his elected, uh, he'd never been elected before, he was chairman of, of Gateway. And in the first term of his gubernatorial uh, administration, he decided to take on Detroit. He bet his reelection on Detroit um, and had been highly supportive. And that was a profile in Kurz. This was 60 years in coming. But one of the things he did, he had consulted with a lot of Detroit folk, including Mayor Bing mm -hmm. and others. And they said, you better get this boy some security because this place may blow up. So one of the first things we were really concerned about was civil unrest. And there were a lot of people in town trying to generate that narrative, some from out of town, right. um, some folks who, who this is their profession. Um, and they float from incident to incident. It's not just Occupy Wall Street. They'll go to Ferguson, same five people. If you look at the press clippings, you'll see the same five people. So they uh, just turn uh, yeah. the sign around and cross yeah, it they out. Just cross and, and this is what they do, and they're paid to go do this. And that's fine. It's you know First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of association. Um, but they were really concerned that there was going to be civil unrest. So the governor actually gave me his um, executive security detail from Michigan State Police. They did not trust Detroit police to provide me with security. Um, there's reasons for that, which I, I can go into. Kwame Kilpatrick had created a new layer of commanders in the police department, and that's what helped him carry on his dirt. Some of you may remember when he came to Washington, D.C. one time, uh, uh, Chief Gaynor, uh, Capitol Police said, we will no longer provide you with executive police services as a VIP because you put our officers at risk. You, hang, you party so hard with the wrong kind of people. We can't hang with you um, with where you go. So, so that was sort of the dynamic. And the governor wanted to be sure that the uh, narrative of the city was not one of civil unrest or unfortunate. I am I'm happy that we never had an incident. Of course, I wasn't told everything. What I was told was, um, we will be with you all the time. You will never go for, through a front door. You're going to go through a lot of kitchens and loading docks, and you will never drive in the city. Um, I said, well, I said, well, I had made plans to ship my car, and I bought a, a, a new car. I was going to say, you can ship it, but you won't drive it. Okay, you, we will drive you everywhere you go. And there were five people full time that picked me up in the morning at my condo doorstep and tucked me in at night, literally. So it's a little different. Right. It's a little different. Right. It's in the bubble. Yeah. So you're doing all this serious stuff. You know, you got the sort of personal implications of it. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of us sort of only know just enough to be dangerous about bankruptcy. Right. Uh, right. You know, you sort of, bankruptcy, mm -hmm. I kind of get what that means, but I don't mm -hmm. really know. And then putting it in the context of a city, right. what does actually bankruptcy mean when it comes to the city of Detroit? Well, the, any enterprise that is insolvent, and in, in a municipal sense, insolvency is a cash flow insolvency. You can't pay your debts as they become due. It's not asset value because under Chapter 9 doctrine, you can't force a municipality um, to sell any assets. Municipality has exclusivity. Unlike Chapter 11 for corporations where they can sell off assets, divisions, patents, whatever, to try to float themselves, a the municipality has the exclusive right to determine how it's going to be organized, and federal law does not require it to sell anything like Detroit Institute of Arts. The other component of that municipality is you can't liquidate a city. Um, literally, people have a right to live where they want to live, 
and you have an obligation to provide them services. So part of the plan cannot be we're going to shut down the city. We're going to close. And, and the elderly, some of whom have been, I met a woman, uh, Miss Dorothy, who met my mother. Uh, she is now 89 years old. Uh, her husband left her when she was 29. She raised six children on a government salary as a single mom and lives in a house that she bought back in 1958, and that's all she has. And her biggest fear when she met my mom at a conference in uh, the summer of 2013 was that I was gonna take her pension and impoverish her. After all she's, and in her final years, um, she wouldn't be able to survive. She had to go on assistance. Uh, she met my mom again in February 2014 mm. and fortunately told her, your son is fair. What he has proposed is fair for me and my fears are allayed. There's nothing better. Let me tell you something. You can have all the accolades and, and everything else. When your mama calls you up and says you're doing a good job, it feels <laughs> really good. Okay? <laughs> and then when your mama says you're all right. So, so when you talk about bankruptcy, what you're trying to do in the enterprise is um, uh, staunch the hemorrhaging, uh, get it to a position where it can cash flow positive and get it off of the debt addiction. The city was just borrowing money again and again, borrowing to borrow, to pay borrowings, to pay borrow. It was just addicted to debt. It, you know, it was using its, its credit card at 28% interest to pay its mortgage. Um, but it's gonna make it up on volume, right? It's gonna get, you, you never catch up. So you, you have to, and that's what chapter nine is designed to do. So a lot of us might say, were there any alternatives? Could Detroit have righted the ship without going into bankruptcy? No. Um, and this is why, after, after being there for a while, it became pretty clear. The, the, the $5.7 billion in uh, OPEB uh, health care obligations, you would have had to reach consensual agreements with the beneficiaries. Detroit was a sponsor. Some states, like New Jersey, the state is a sponsor. So some of your states, if, if you work there, may be different. But Detroit's a sponsor. It has the obligation. It had been deferring pension payment obligations for a decade. And so it has $600 million in pension deferments it couldn't pay. And it'd be giving script for those payments at 8% interest. So it was even borrowing money essentially by deferring from the pension wow. funds, which it would never make up. The other thing is, um, uh, even if you tried to restructure outside of bankruptcy, there's successor liability for your financial creditors. Financial creditors have covenants, they have liens, they have liens on millages mm -hmm. and other issues. They are never going to agree to concessions, not because they're, they're hard, bark and they don't want to, they have fiduciary obligations to their creditors, their shareholders, their boards of directors. And outside of an extraordinary system where they can go back and discharge their fiduciary obligation and their directors can exercise their business judgment that you say we're in federal court, we're in bankruptcy, and the upside risk is we're going to get crammed down, so this deal that's on the table is better, and that then becomes a rational decision within their business judgment they can justify so they won't get sued and have a director and officer's liability issue on the financial side, then they can't make that decision in the ordinary course because the typical decision in the ordinary course for a financial institution is, well, let's sue and be first in line to get a judgment. And there's a principle in the LTGO, uh, uh, limited tax general obligation bonds and UTGO community that you have first dollars out above GEO bonds, just general op. So they'd be a rush to the courthouse, a cascade of litigation, get judgments, and then some of that doctrine under Michigan law, if you get a judgment, you can put that judgment to the municipality, and they have to raise enough taxes to pay the judgment. So now you're back in that so feedback vicious cycle. vicious cycle of right. running people out of the city. You keep raising the tax rate, you keep running people out, you never pay the judgment, so the city declines. The, the third reason you can't do it in your ordinary course, quite frankly, is political will. Um, those of you who've worked in government know that any politician, Rahm Emanuel, um, decides to take on unions front and center um, and adjust expected benefits. And in all fairness to the union community, these are people who have done their job, right? They worked for a municipality. They were told you work for 30 years, you're going to get these benefits. They planned their affairs on this basis. They're now retired, either at their house or down at Phoenix. Or, and a or side wherever. note, is it yeah. fair to say that the benefit packages of Detroit residents weren't disproportionately higher than other cities? No, they were. They were. Oh. But, but they, they, they were 108. Benefits were 108% of compensation, which is high. In fact, the healthcare mm. benefits were platinum level mm. under the ACA. But, mm. but, but the, the, the juxtaposition for that was their compensation was relatively low. Um, in Atlantic City, for instance, lieutenants may make $180,000. In Detroit, you know, lieutenants may be making 60 or 70. So you, you get relatively lower compensation that you're going to get a good retirement package, although some of it vests in 20, 25 years. Right. So you know, you, there was this thing where you can start working at 18, 20, you can retire at 40, 
You can go get another job. You spend another 15 years, you get another pension. At 55, 60, you got two pensions and healthcare systems. And that's okay, they're, they're playing the system, but, but that, that obligation kicked in and it was very unlikely you're gonna get a consensual resolution in the ordinary course. So we needed to go into bankruptcy. Why did we need an emergency manager to, to manage it? it? It wasn't just an emergency manager. And maybe you should tell the crowd what is an emergency yeah. manager. It's a different context. Um, you know, I, I said this one time uh, at, on MSNBC when, when one of the uh, political leaders was saying this is a deprivation of democracy. I said, no, actually it's not. The concept of a receiver has existed in old English law since the uh, British Admiralty began to lose ships. And if any enterprise started to falter, you'd put it in a receiver, which is essentially what an emergency manager is. Mm -hmm. Someone who has extraordinary powers over the ordinary course of governance and management of an enterprise to make quick changes and then turn the enterprise back to its owners to the regular course. The, the issue for me wasn't so much me as the emergency manager is that I had a very powerful state statute, state statute 436, which was controversial. It's passed by uh, uh, Governor Snyder but essentially denuded the city of its elected leadership, the mayor and the city council. Um, they had no authority, you can't fire them, they're elected, but they had no authority, no salary, no, no offices, unless that authority was redelegated to them. The reason being the hard decisions that I had to make as emerged, I have no political aspirations, um, I'm coming to this as an honest broker, I'm looking at it from an objective standpoint, I haven't made commitments to my campaign manager to get elected, uh, to the unions that, that sent out the robocalls to turn out the vote for me that I'm now gonna have to go back on. I have, I'm not breaking my word, I'm, I'm a fresh face. So in a sense, I'm, I'm the sin eater for the elected officials. I will do the dirty work that needs to get done. I will hold them harmless from it. It's, 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 it's a little sharp and it doesn't feel right, but at the end, I'm gonna return this enterprise back to you clean and fresh and burnished up I'm gonna leave you with $200 million and retain cash, which is more money any mayor in the history of Detroit has had. I'm gonna leave you with a better balance sheet, a better credit rating, better operations. I'm gonna hire you a new CFO, a new police chief, a new lighting director. I'm gonna bring in Gary Brown, who was the internal affairs director, was a city council president pro tem as chief operating officer. We're gonna bring in Beth Nyblick from uh, uh, Louisville to create an IT system that's 13 years old yep. to upgrade it, and I'll leave. And you can blame me for everything. In fact, the conversations we had when I came in, I tried to speak in alliterations, and what I said, Detroit has 32,000 churches, so I tried to use parables. I said, you know, I offer a sincere olive branch. And I would sit down with them, i say, look, you can say anything you want to about me. There's only two things I ask of you. One, let's not incite civil, incite civil unrest. That's irresponsible as an elected official. This is your city. You're gonna get it back, and how you behave here may define this city for another generation, okay? Mm -hmm. I said, number two, let's not give the international press and others their Django moment. And what I mean by that, let's not have us, as people of color, down on the ground, banging each other's brains out, because that's what they want to see. That's what drives the news. Let's behave with dignity. Let's behave with maturity. Mm -hmm. you, you have, I'm not trying to squash, somebody said, oh, he's asking for a vote of fealty. No, I'm not trying to squash discussion. I'm trying to make sure that we get through this with as little drama as we can, so that we behave in a dignified and mature manner, and the city, this maiden that has been neglected and abused, the city comes out of this looking well. If we can do that, I'm gonna go away. I'm a snapshot in the history of the city. Mm -hmm. This is your city. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my petite bourgeois feet lifestyle, you know, in corporate <laughs> world, um, and worry about, you know, whatever I do in that world here in Washington, D.C., but you'll have your city back and it'll be better. Don't, why wouldn't you, as a rational standpoint, and we, right. we worked our way to a position where we understood that. Right. And so you talked about coming out of bankruptcy. Right. And so putting that in an urban planning context, how did the going through the bankruptcy process, cutting those deals, right. by virtue of the powers you had, how did that allow or how does that allow the leadership of Detroit to now do the planning right. and the neighborhood revitalization right. things that they're doing? Well, well most of you know a municipality should do five things really well, right? Putting aside enterprise functions. Finance, tax, administration, public safety, public health, planning, zoning, okay, and, and development, uh, parks and recreation, right? And what's the fifth one I used to say? Finance, tax, planning, zoning, public relations, parks, health, planning, zoning, what was it? Uh, transportation is an enterprise. Water, transportation, parking are on the enterprise, but there's a fifth one that municipalities have to do really, really well to, to fund services. Transportation is key, but I call those enterprise functions. Uh, no, education actually I call an enterprise function too because, because the reality is 
those functions should, one, both fund themselves and produce a net positive benefit. So if you're doing water, you should fund yourself. If you're doing transportation, you should pay for yourself. You shouldn't be a drain on the general fund. But the general fund needs to do, do those five things really, really well. Coming out of bankruptcy, one of the chief ones is planning and development. Because right? mm -hmm. you look at a 139 mile square footprint and you're saying, so okay, we've got dilapidated homes, poor lighting, bad um, um, patrol services. How do we get our grips around this? One of the things you can do, I left a series of orders in place, about seven of them when I left. It was in the finance cluster, it was in IT, it was planning and zoning, it was HR. It was basically supercharging the authority of the mayor and the city council to bypass the charter, quite frankly, um, so that it could move quicker in the next year to address rezoning, to address blight, to deal with commercial, to do some of the things that Mike wants to do outside mm -hmm. of the charter. Mm -hmm. The reason I say that is the, the charter was a 2012 charter. It was an anti kwame charter. So this pendulum had swung from basically a strong mayor model where a lot of folly had behaved, to, swung the other way right. to an anti kwame charter where, for instance, um, the police commission was in charge of the police department. The only thing the mayor, did, uh, mayor does under the current charter is the police chief serves at the pleasure of the mayor. All promotions, assignments, discipline, reassignments have to go through the commission. The commission is an elected body who goes through a political process that has the neighborhood uh, advisor or, or this type of person as their <laughs> right. patron. So you're politicizing the police department, the very thing we're trying to get rid of at the time. So you want to bypass that for a period of time. And Chief Craig, much as credit, has driven down crime by 20% in eight months. How did he do that? He asked the police to work. He restored a sense of responsibility, honor, and dignity, and accountability in the department. We, ha we had virtual precincts. Some of our districts are so bad, 6 o'clock precinct closed. There's a, there's a box outside with a blue light on it. You run up, pick up a phone. Your perpetrator, if his domestic violence call is right behind you, about to clock you again or beat you to death, and you're on the phone asking somebody to come at a precinct. 12-hour okay? shifts. When I came there, the first thing the police officer said, it said to me, I said, you're important. Public safety is a priority. Want to get to it? What do you want? I thought it was going to be uh, more free time. I want, I want my 10% pay cut that they took in 2009 restored. I want my, you know what they wanted? I want court time. I want the ability to get off a 12-hour shift, to go home, take a shower, have a hygiene break, see my kids, and go to court to put away the guy I just arrested who's thumbing his nose at me. I want to get off an eight-hour shift so I can go to court. That's what they wanted. It was, it, it, it was amazing. So when you talk about planning and zoning, you make it safe. You can now plan for neighborhoods like Mike Illich is doing. Yep. Uh, we supercharged the approval process, which he's still going through, mm -hmm. for his uh, a new stadium and, um, and five new neighbors in that, in that district. But the thing that makes it work is now that there's more management in the city, his credit risk and therefore his cost of funds yep. to do the development comes down. He can put in new neighborhoods quicker. That's going to generate tax income from the city. It will revitalize quicker. If it gets lucky, and we can get out of CBD, the uh, uh, Woodward Cass Corridor up to New Center, yep. Yep. if we get lucky, it will be concentric. And, and the reason I say that is people forget, you know, the Municipal Assistance Corporation in uh, New York in 1977, New York was a basket case. It had lost over almost a million manufacturing. People think of New York as being a financial center. In the 70s, it was a manufacturing center. All those places in Brooklyn were manufacturing jobs. It had been devastated. Miami, a paradise lost um, on Time Magazine. It had riots in 81, 82, and 83. Will the last American out turn off the lights? Was saying, now it's thriving. If we get lucky and do this, you can turn a municipality in the span of 10 and 20 years to be a thriving environment. But you have to start with safety, with planning that makes sense, and with supercharging regular order. And that's what bankruptcy on the operational side. On the balance sheet side, we got rid of a lot of debt. But what people miss is on the operational side, we restructured how the city can run. <laughs> so last question kind of relating to neighborhood revitalization. I mean, we kind of alluded to this question of you have this landmass right. and you have parts of the city that it would take a very long time to repopulate. Let's just say it that way. Right, right. Um, What's your sense of what the city can do now that its balance sheet has been, been right-sized? Well, 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 the city is pushing out services and running at a much better level, a much shorter time frame. In fact, it's actually running a surplus. Um, our projections were relatively conservative so that the city could hit its marks for the next nine years. 
Um, it is, doesn't have to go to capital markets for 10 years. It's relieved of pension funding obligations for nine years unless there's restoration so it can stay out of that business for a while. But if it, if it meets its reinvestment and restructuring initiatives over the next years, it will actually cash flow positive plus. So, so what does it need to do? It needs to make sure that it, it anchors the CBD, Central Business District, and that development grows out concentrically from that. The second thing it needs to do, there's a plan called Detroit Future Cities, which yep. was financed by Kresge yep. um, Corporation, which actually provides for 5, 10, 25, 50 year plans to shrink the city in terms of a service delivery base. You said the S word in public? Yeah, I did, yeah, I did. Huh. Now, I'm not talking about, to, to, okay, let, let me rephrase that. Um, to, to, Try to get them to walk to create To create an appropriate level of density given the footprint of the city. This man's okay. well taught. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. That, that, that way. But bring it together so that, and frankly, part of that is recognize that in some neighborhoods, as all cities have lives, they age, they come and they ebb and flow. Uh, there, there's a, a French uh, writer that wrote a great book about it. As a city ebbs and flows on a, on a sine wave, goes back and forth, you want to catch the upswing so the city reinvents and gets ready for the next downswing. Because mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what happens. And so for, for us, we're now in the upswing, and if we do it right, uh, we will address both the central business district interior, and then we'll be able to get to the neighborhoods. But that's a long-term solution. And the schools, which was not part of my mission, are critically important uh, to that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's one thing. last question, I think, is personal. I just mm -hmm. want to ask the audience, how many people here uh, are in graduate school? OK, good, good amount. Mm -hmm. How many of you are in law school, business school, urban planning, real estate? Okay. Um, last question I had for you is a question I'm hoping has never been asked of you. Okay. Which okay. is highly educated person, lawyer, has a background. Right. Um, but you've been put in a context where you are doing way more than just lawyering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You are a business person. Mm -hmm. You are doing regulatory issues. You are helping to manage a city. Right. Um, how did you navigate sort of taking your legal background, this sort of particular specific background and transferring that into a different environment where you had to use a lot of other skills that you didn't learn, learn in law school? No, that's, that's it, it's, at the end of the day, I think it's all life skills. I mean, everybody said, well, you're not a mayor. I said, well, most people aren't president until they're president. There's a book called The President's Club, and it chronicles that most presidents on, on the day after their first daily briefing, the first thought that props in their mind is, can I give it back? Um, because now they realize what the job, but they either, some rise to the occasion, Herbert Hoover, some, Herbert Hoover didn't, okay? Some, but at the end of the day, and that's a good question, is it's all judgment and logic, hmm. okay? It's, it's just you're getting a range of options, you're looking at a problem, you're trying to figure out based upon what you know of human nature, finance, law, behavioral science, operations, and the need of the, of the people for whom you're sworn to, to protect, serve and protect, and trying to come up with a judgment. They're really good cops that go on and become lieutenants, sergeants, and chiefs, and they're really bad cops that never should have worn the badge. What's that about? At that split second, making that critical decision making. Some make it well, some make it poorly. It's judgment. There are two people in our society that can take life. One is a learned judge after a slew of due process, a court case, all of the constitutional rights that are contained in the Bill of Rights, and the other is an officer on the job in the dead of night in the span of two seconds, okay? You need people with good judgment in both of those jobs, and that's all this is, is human nature and judgment. Oh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have, uh, we have some, some time for Q&A, um, mm -hmm. so sure. let's, let's have at it. Uh, so if you could just uh, introduce yourself and then ask a brief question. Donald Gibson, Kevin, thanks for uh, coming here tonight. Sure, sure. I'm curious, can you talk a little bit about the team that you had to build around yourself in order to execute and deliver all the changes that needed to happen? Who yeah, did this, you this, bring thank with you for you? that, because um, this really was a team effort. But this goes back to Governor Snyder. Um, he had people on the ground, um, Miller Buckfire, Conway McKenzie, who were operational consultants, and Ernst & Young, who were the uh, auditors, but as well as the financial projections and economists on the ground a year and a half before I got there. So, and, and there had been a series of reports. There was a uh, February 2012 Detroit Review team with a report in March uh, 2012, a uh, MOU, Memorandum of Understanding with the city, 
in April 2012, there was a memorandum of Detroit PNDD reform. PDD to DAG. PD, yeah, they, we, we use all the, <laughs> right, the right, acronyms. Right, right, right. But there, there was another uh, 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 memorandum of Detroit reform in November uh, 2012, another Detroit review team in December 2012 with a report in February 2013, and the governor's findings of fact, 22 pages findings of fact in March 4th, 2013. So, so the, the, of the four core, what I called my restructuring professionals, um, Ernst & Young, Conway McKenzie, Miller Buckfire is our investment banker. Three of that four had been hired before I got there. The other was my old law firm, Jones, Jones Day, which was the way I got exposed to this was coming to do the pitch for the work. And then once they, be, they called up um, my managing partner, Steve Brogan, a friend of mine said, we want to hire your man. I said, well, I'm going to recuse myself from the pitch team. And then I started talking about going. And this was in February 2013. And a month later, I was in Detroit. So of the, of the four core members, three were already on the ground. Jones Day was the only fourth one that came in after that. Um, but I trusted them. I'd worked with them all, and I trusted them all implicitly. Jeff Kessler, great hey, Jeff. Thank you, sir. I really admire your work. It's fantastic. You. Uh, full disclosure, I grew up in the Detroit area, but not in the city. I've got to be clear. Uh, you know, Royal Oak, Birmingham, Detroit. I will take you. Okay, we'll take it's you. cool. Okay. Love Detroit. <laughs> Glad to see. Bankruptcy was the only right. solution, no doubt about it. Um, um, and also, full disclosure, I used to be the economic development director in Oakland County, so oh, I competed okay. with Detroit. My, my buddy, my buddy Brooks is uh, okay. one of my, I can't keep up with him used drinking, but he's, he's a buddy of mine. Yeah. Brooks. Okay. Yeah, he, Brooks is what, 70 some odd years yeah. old, drinking on the and table. And he's going to run again, by the and way. And he's going to run again, and he's going to run again. Uh, two part question, unrelated, but uh, you've got a unique perspective. Um, the white middle class left Detroit, the mm. black middle class left Detroit. Right. How does Detroit get a middle class? When my grandparents were there and my mm -hmm. folks and so forth, Detroit had a viable middle class. That's what drove that city, what made it work. That's question one. Question two is, Mike Duggan and the city council, how's that dynamic working? Um, is that going to keep Good driving question. this forward? Yeah. Good question. First question. Um, uh, it's it's three quarters of people in this room. The young, the urban pioneers. The, the next generation of leadership that are coming into the Central Business District, and it, it is exploding. I mean, it's not just Shinola, it's not just Detroit Bikes, um, there's a new furniture company, it's not just a jazz downtown with a David Whitney, but it's the young people coming in town who see this as a great opportunity, much the way I did in 1983 when I went back to, uh, back to Miami, and everybody's saying, why are you going there? This is after the Mario boat lift, this is after all the riots, all the crime, this is after the Arthur McDuffie killing, which it caused a number of different riots uh, in Liberty City, Comer, Overtown. Oh, yeah. People are saying, why are you going there? Because there's opportunity. And I'm on the ground. I get to meet the mayor, Javier Suarez. I get to be the first in court. This is going to be fun. And if it doesn't work, I'm 25 years old. I can get the hell out of here in another three years, right? But meantime, this is the only time. I can't do, I'm 56 with two kids and a wife. I can't do that now. It counts. You know, another 20 years, I have one foot in the grave, another on a banana peel. You know, I, I got to make this thing work, right? Because I got to start thinking about retirement. But when you're 25, you can do it. I mean, at this age, you can't. Now, here's the catch, though. So, so first part of your question, how does it happen? We already have that influx of young people. They start getting married, start having kids, start saying, where am I sending my kids to school? That's the next transition step. So you, you got to make that an attractive opportunity. Um, the second part of your question, uh, it, remind me the second part of your question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Doug and the city council, I want to make sure it wasn't just Mike. Um, the second part of your question, the, the eyes of the world are on them. Um, there's been a lot of work and effort put into this, um, a lot of blood, tears, toils, and sweat put into it. They know that. Um, they know that they will be judged in history. I'm not worried about Mike. I went to law school with Mike. Mike's, Mike's very resolute. He's a creature of his environment. He, he grew up under McNamara. He is a political creature to his bone. So he, he knows that if he has any greater aspirations, you know, mayor, governor in waiting, senator, whatever, he's got to get this right. Um, the council from time to time has the ability to get a little, uh, get a little uh, immature, but so far, so good. This is important. So in the short term, I'm, I'm very confident of the way they're behaving, and I'm very proud of the way they're interacting. So some hands in the back. Put some, oh, oh, he's got the microphone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you again. I, too, am a fan of your work. I'm Jonathan Bush. I'm in the Masters of Urban and Regional Planning Program. I think you kind of touched on my question a little bit, but I just kind of wanted to hear more of your thoughts. I heard you mention that um, education was not a part of right. the program, right. and I just kind of wanted to get your take on why or why not. I guess. Well, they're, they're, they're two separate systems. Unlike D.C., where the educational system is under the, the mayor, some would say, Detroit Public Schools is a separate enterprise. It has an emergency manager. It's going through a reform right now. But the other thing is, quite frankly, to be honest with you, um, I, my mother was superintendent of Broward County Schools, fifth largest district in the nation. My uncle 
was president of the American Federation of Teachers, Florida. He was the first Secretary of Labor um, in Florida, black Secretary of Labor in Florida since Reconstruction under Governor Graham when he became uh, governor for two terms. Uh, my, my sister, my cousins, my aunt um, are all teachers. So I, I grew, I helped my mother collect her data for her uh, PhD for early childhood education, special needs. So I'm, I'm very, very much in tune with the need for education and, and what it requires. It's harder than restructuring the balance sheet of a city because you're dealing with children. And at the end of the day, you're experimenting with what you're going to do. And you're dealing with parents who want the same thing that every other parent wants who goes to an independent school. Right. Bullis Beauvoir said, well, parents want the same thing that parents over in Anacostia want, a better opportunity and education for their kids. And it's hard to see how I can get that out. That wasn't within my bailiwick, but it's pretty critical because the very thing that's gonna happen when the 30 and 40 year old generation start growing, they have to have an alternative for their kids and be able to reach that agreement. So they're working on it. I, I think they have some plans, but it's, it's pretty crucial. Sure. Two more questions. Uh, Mr. Orr, thank you very yes, much sir. for coming. Um, my name is David Salmon. I'm David. a second semester urban planning student. Um, as it relates to Detroit, um, you mentioned uh, capital markets. Um, is there a by any chance, are you looking for foreign investments uh, in the oh, sense yeah. of stabilizing the city? Oh. And as it relates to the district, right. um, I understand that you worked for worked on Greater Southeast when, uh, in regards yeah, to stabilizing yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, hospital. Yeah, DCS, yeah. Is it more? Is it more useful to preserve the hospital, or would it be more effective to invest in? rebuilding or building a new hospital altogether in Southeast area? Okay, well those are two questions. First of all, uh, the foreign investment angle, absolutely. Um, there, there's a lot of sovereign wealth and just dumb money out there. I mean, the, the amount, you know, I grew up in a time when there were three economic engines in the world. There was United States, Japan, and Germany, and, and they depended on us, and we depended on them. Uh, the other third of the world, China, India, Asian Tigers, Singapore, are all coming online. So it's a different challenge, but it's also generating a huge amount of capital, capital outflows, and it's looking for a place to land. And a lot of them are there, Singaporeans, the Chinese, the Israelis, uh, Russians, um, because they see the value proposition. Buy low, Dan Gilbert. Got uh, owns quickly. Dan Gilbert got outbid. Dan Gilbert, got, Dan Bil Gilbert owns 74 buildings, and he got outbid on another one. I mean, each city has a sponsor. You know, you have uh, William Randolph Hearst, you have Leland Stanford, you have uh, Astor and Rockefeller. We've got Dan Gilbert and Mike Illich. Okay, they're our sponsors. Dan got outbid for a building. But uh, foreign capital is flowing into the city, and that is a good thing. You have to be careful of a bubble uh, because uh, uh, flight capital can be stupid. Um, looking for a value proposition, it will overbid. Um, some of the distressed capital will try to actually drive it up. Look at Herbalife. Uh, there's a short seller in there that's trying to increase uh, federal investigation so he can sell short and get out and make money. Same thing can happen in the real estate market uh, with foreign capital. You have to be careful of that. But it, it's there, and we're very hopeful. Um, that it works very well. Second part of your question, um, remind me again, because I'm, I'm gonna make sure I get it. Yeah, get DCHC. You know, that, that was so long ago. Um, uh, the problem with DCHC was just the, the patient senses of unpaid care that it could not cash flow. It just couldn't. And here, here's the crime. DC has great hospitals. They're just on this side of 16th Street, right? Okay, so they were the ambulance companies and, and the protocol was they weren't going to bring them over here to GW or bring them over here to Sibley, okay, concierge care. They bring them to DCHC, okay, shooting victims. Well, that drove the hospital under. So until, until you, you fix both the operational concern of, of how much you're going to force an enterprise or subsidize, you can open it, but who's going to pay for it? Is city going to pay for it? It's going to be subsidized. You're going to have a certain amount, number of managed care. Are you going to bring some of those non-critical patients over here to GW? This nice new hospital is built on the circle. Uh, some people may not want that. H how's that going to work so you don't drive it down again? Because at the end of the day, you can't give away free services. It, it, it doesn't work anyway. You can't give away free pencils, right? You can't give away free services. Last question. Um, Karina Rex with Transportation yes, Planner. I want to uh, hear some about the region and the role of the adjacent jurisdictions in, in both planning and the economic recovery of Great the city. Question. Great question. Um, summer of 2013, there was a survey, I forget the group, taken by uh, regional uh, municipal managers, 
and they asked what was the number one priority, and by 66%, they said regional cooperation, which we don't have. Okay, we've been trying to get a regional transportation center for a decade, and it failed in 20, into 2013 again. Um, we, in, in fact, some of the structures in the city, for instance, by city law, um, uh, Mark, the, the regional transportation company, cannot pick up passengers on the DDT, Detroit um, Transportation Systems bus line. They're prohibited, even if they're on schedule. We need 224 buses to roll out depot every day, otherwise we don't make schedule. When I came, we were averaging somewhere in the neighborhood 168, 173. We're now getting into a 205 or so, but we, we still need to make schedule. If we could get that regional cooperation, you have to make sure that either you regionalize the bus system so that you don't destroy it, because some of the, some of the regional buses aren't gonna make the local schedule and take our kids to school. They're gonna have to walk further. You know, they're, they're consequences in the snow, in the heat, in the rain, and you don't want that. Okay? You don't want the workers trying to get to work to have to change their schedule with a single mom with three kids from having to get up an hour early to having to get up two hours early because 45 minutes of that two hours, she's gotta to get to a new bus route. So you don't want that, but you do want regional cooperation. The good news is in the water department, Brooks Patterson uh, from Oakland County, uh, Mark Hackle, uh, Mike Duggan, and Jim Fancano, who since lost, were able to deal with 30, 33 years of neglect when Judge Fikens in 77 said we need to regionalize the water system. We were able to do that in the bankruptcy and enter into a memorandum of understanding. And the reason why was, one, we were able to address the county's concerns of rate pressures and non-collections from the municipality and wall them off from it by making them wholesale customers of the system. So they're responsible for their own rate payers and not for Detroit's non-payment history. That's on us, on the city. Two, as part of the authority, we were able to extinguish successor liability from the debts, both, both operational, meaning labor, healthcare, others, but financial, um, from the new authority so it starts clean. You could not extinguish that successor liability in the ordinary course that would have followed with the enterprise because that was the covenant written into the indenture. So once we were able to give them those protections, um, they were able to come together and get regionalization for the water department. I am hoping, I'm hoping that is a model for transportation um, and for fire, frankly, um, which could be spread around. Um, the police is a little different, but fire could be a regional cooperation, especially for some of the outlying areas in the city which are closer to Royal Oak and Dearborn than they are to downtown Detroit. So we'll see um, if, if, if this water thing works well. I'm, I'm hoping people say, hey, you know, Detroit is not the, uh, the redheaded stepchild that we think it is. Um, we can work with it. Um, we have spent the semester uh, exploring a number of different dialogues around how cities change quickly. Right, right. And this conversation tonight has really been an anchor, an incredible set of insights uh, right. into how you preside over that right. and the role of planning in that. I'd like to thank you very, sure. very much to both of you, to Kevin and to you. It's been a truly, truly amazing conversation. And uh, thank you and welcome to Georgetown and uh, come back anytime. Anytime, happy to do it. Thank okay. you very much.